Welcome to the Academy of Esports Podcast. I am your host, James O'Hagan, and I get to welcome back Dr. Clint Kennedy, but also we are adding into the mix a third person to our interview, this or conversation, sorry, I stopped calling these interviews. These are much better as conversations. Dr. Miles Harvey, uh, you are an educator down in uh, New Mexico, a middle school teacher in New Mexico. And here's what I love about you and I admire about you. Your classroom is looks like most kids' dream bedrooms, if you will. <laughs> minus, I, I, now, minus the, the conforming chairs that make us all sit in rows, but a lot of that is always about budget. But you've really uh, taken your classroom and said, you know what, I'm not just going to have an esports space. I'm going to bring the esports space into my classroom. Correct. Right? Yeah. What, what, what your students must have uh, either gotten really geeked out from that or they're just now like you know accept it and it's just normal for them what 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 has that been like for you especially now coming back because your kids just came back off of COVID too right like for my new students this year they're like wow this is great you know um but like when my student teacher from five years ago walks into the room they're like wow so things have really developed huh and I'm like yeah <laughs> So for the kid who comes in, you know, the everyday present 13 year old, whether it's next year, or the year after next, like they have this idea of like what class should be, you know, and I'm lucky enough to be there. But there was a point when like I was the one in school that kids knew, like I had a PlayStation in my room and that somewhere in the school, like there was a teacher with one in there, you know, and sixth graders be like, I think that's the guy with the PS4. Like, <laughs> We've grown a lot in five years. Now we have real gaming devices. And so it's just great to speak with you all about this because this topic is like pervasive and it's something that no one's really discussing is like, what are we doing about it at the teacher prep level in the classroom level? Like, what are we doing now for real? Well, what you want, I wanted to say is here's the teacher with the PS4 and the PhD, because that is something too. I think that a lot of people, um, you know, may wonder, how do I get this started? Do I have to have the PhD? But, you know, you as you've posted, very, like I said, I follow you on LinkedIn. I love your posts on LinkedIn. They're always very thoughtful. But it isn't just a you lift kind of thing. You've really tapped into your community around your school and your school district to, to really get to where you are at this point with, you know, having that classroom look like the way that it is and the inviting space that it is. No, that's actually very well said. I, I think... At first, you know, even in grad school, I wondered why I was writing these assignments or doing these kind of writing things. And then that turned into, you know, later on as a teacher, learning how to write grants and be competent enough to organize your thoughts in a meaningful way. And with the passion for esports and, you know, kind of this entrepreneurial spirit, I'm like, you know what, like, let's make the lab in here. Let's tap into all of that stuff that we always talk about as scholar gamers and bring it right back into the very place that matters most. And I had this thought with like all of this Chromebook autonomy and, and a lot of these one-to-one -one ratios, the traditional even innovative lab is beginning to disappear because now we're thinking, what does that mean to go to the lab? Like we all have one now. And I thought, well, yeah, like, why do I need to go to the gaming room? That's my classroom. Like, that's just where we do these exercises. So it's like, well, here we are. And, um, you know, I look at the community that's backed it up. And I'm like, wow, APS Ed Foundation, thank you so much for then having a board of people that are culturally responsive enough to go, you know what, that's actually a good idea. We should listen to that person. And, you know, I just try and cite the evidence and support it with literature. And I really go back to that grad school approach of, you know, it's not just what you think and feel. It's like, who are the, you know, the the giants you're standing on the shoulders of? And, and can you explain that transparency? And I think we have now with LED lights and those clear glass computers, it couldn't be more transparent enough how exciting and how cool this stuff is in the classroom. Right. And... You know, we I know we wanted to get into today. It isn't just about, I guess, teacher development, you know, in the esports space, because I think that that's something I go back a few years and, and Clint and I talked about this on our, our episode where uh, I was working with James Kozachuk years before Play Versus got started. And we were looking at developing a platform. And I said, we really have to hone in on teacher professional learning and professional development because you're going to be coming in with a lot of there's going to be some teachers who get this right away who are in the gaming space but more more than not you're going to not find these 
these teachers who can speak to this on an educational level or know how to coach or how to troubleshoot or things like that. I mean, it's been uh, for for those who are are just getting into this now, it can be completely um, intimidating, especially when you get a phone call saying, hey, your kids signed up for esports uh, through our, uh, you know, play versus or whatever. And uh, now you're expected to all of a sudden try to adopt a program. And, and, and now we'll kind of open this up here. So Clint, please do jump in. You're just kind of sitting there stoically. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm a fanboy, so I'm in, enjoying this. I have to say, though, I was a little nervous for tonight's episode simply because we're <laughs> following, I think, was your probably your most watched episode uh, last week. It's hard to... Uh, it's hard to to mess with your mom, James. So so I I did have a little nerves coming in There's here, that, but, yeah. but Miles, I think we could try to live up to the bar that was set last week. Um, and I yeah. I'm so, I apologize. I just have to roll out for a second. Apparently, the sunlight is coming through, and it's making me look like a ghost of some kind on the podcast. So hold on. Oh, a second. Okay. For those of you who All are right, watching, well, while, while we're waiting for the environment, there we go. To change, I, I'm going to push back a little bit, Jim, because the. Yeah. My, my this is anecdotal. My experience when when I first started this in the high schools that I was working in, certainly there were those teachers that that kind of looked at you side eyed. And, what are you doing? And this is inappropriate, et cetera, et cetera. All these things that, especially the people that I'm sure are watching tonight, are, are are hearing and so forth. But there's there's this underground movement. There's it's almost generational change where I, I once I pulled back the covers, I they. People, well-intentioned people, kind of came out of the woodwork and say, "I've been playing Overwatch with my son for a couple of years now. Yeah. How does this? How can we have this conversation as part of my formal, you know, as my formal work with my students at school? How can I get support? What are the systems that can help scaffold for this and so forth?" So, I don't disagree, but I also think a component of this is opening up the pulling back the curtain and opening it up and welcoming people in because i found again anecdotally there were a lot of people that wanted to jump in and help because they were really were able to make those connections once the conversation was started they just weren't ready to jump in necessarily first or didn't know what those next steps were so that that's been my and i and i think that momentum will continue as we continue to see generations of teachers go through traditional prep programs and then this will not be a foreign topic to them that being said to miles point that really kicked this whole conversation off i think it should be part of that formal plan of study and i'd love to get into ultimately what that can look like and is the goal ultimately esports or is the esports a trojan horse for better learning uh, additional curriculum standards, et cetera, et cetera, which I'm really excited for. And it's the work that I'm doing now uh, with Learn to Esport is really providing a scaffolding and a platform to do that. That's where I'm headed anyway. Well, and and here's the thing, too, is that when we talk about professional learning, you know, we have experiences that can be shared across K-5, K-8, K-12, or sometimes things are high school specific, some things are middle uh, Miles, you're a middle school teacher. God bless you for doing that because I was a fifth grade educator for many years. And at, at the end of the year, when those kids are starting to turn into little teenage monsters, and I'm just like, don't come back to my room until you're in eighth grade. Please just go <laughs> off to middle school and have that middle school experience. It takes a special breed of person to do that. And I salute you for, for tackling the middle school years. But you know, we can't even just think of this as a blanket, you know, as you're saying, esports prep. And I don't even think we were calling it esports prep. I think what we're alluding to is finding ways to just like how we engage kids in other things. We can use esports as an engagement tool for teachers who are preparing for uh, their experiences. But again, we have to think about age appropriateness for what we're trying to get at. Right. right? With with our with our prep programs, because dealing with the middle age a uh, middle school student is very different than dealing with a high school student on, on many levels. So I don't know if you, that's, that's interesting. You know, like I, I also teach at the university of New Mexico in the college. Wow. Of Ed. You got it all over the place, my friend. I know it, but the cool <laughs> thing is I can Jack be nimble between like, I go to the class to teach teachers how to teach English. And like, then I go back to the classroom where I'm like, ah, let's go see if this works, you know, cause I'm going back <laughs> to these teachers who are supposed to be going out there. Right. And so mm -hmm. clinical trials. In yeah. The like I get to, and I think of it like in a traditional course, I get 18 weeks in college to teach them something. And I kind of represent it like a pie chart. 
And you know what? One eighteenth is esports, and it's important. It's just as much as comic books shoved in there, and then film is lit was shoved in there, and everything that has happened as an evolution, or as we spoke to at the beginning, has forced the conversation. I mean, the average age of a teacher is forty-two in this country. Average age of a gamer is somewhere around mid thirties. But I think what's interesting is we don't ask that question about. Who's a, who's a reader, who's a movie watcher. We'd say that's synonymous with being a teacher. And so the lens of having games and good games in our repertoire of experiences is just a matter of time before, you know, the average age of a teacher is the average age of a gamer. And we'll go, well, yeah, we already see it this way. So that mm-hmm. The job now is to try and get people to go out into the field before we reach this intersecting point of data that's ready to do this, you know, and ready to... Ha- Think about, you know, these digital ways of making sense of of a curriculum and people go, well, who's supposed to teach this course? And I go, don't treat this material like it's something special. That's like saying that like a math teacher couldn't use a book, right, because they're not certified in ELA. I go, it's a tool like and everyone should be able to use it in some way. Minecraft's a good example. It's so interdisciplinary just as a as a learning tool that it's very inviting to go. Well, here's the very edutainment version kind of thing you might be looking for algebra teacher but there's more right and like Mm -hmm. it's just the tap and so i think we're there this is the exciting time of it all so i sorry jim i don't mean to jump in i guess where my mind goes is i'm trying to decide and maybe we do this in parallel but do we provide more opportunities for people to construct on their own for themselves how real true esports or video games not edutainment not edu games i don't want space invaders where i'm shooting times tables not interested in that <laughs> thank but you but are we are we are we is the is the next step to to make those connections between how this can be part of the traditional curriculum and or is it also and again this is my totally my bias and i won't tell you my origin story again 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 but to me, it's being able to attack some of the skills, habits of mind, and knowledge around soft skills, 21st century skills. I wish we had a better term. We've been struggling for this for now 21 years. Um, I moved on, on this, to 22nd century skills. That's great. Love it. My, st- my kids. Can I hear 23rd? But or do do we do those in parallel? Because that to me is 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 what will really move the dial. We've been struggling for you know working in public schools for 20 years. How do we help? you know, in a, in a structured fashion, do this and capstone projects, senior years to me was a great start. Sadly, my experience has been a lot of these soft skills. We want them to be demonstrating proficiency in their senior year in a capstone project, 70, 80% of those skills they're doing for the first time, which is better than nothing, but I much rather have the true spirit of a capstone project where they're actually demonstrating growth and ultimately proficiency in, in, you know, whether it's P21s, 4Cs or whatever the case may be. So I guess my question is, can we do both at the same time? Do we start with, with what you kind of teed up, Miles, because then we're only dealing with kind of one additional variable and maybe not two? I guess that's where I'm struggling with where we should be heading next. Hmm. Well, and, and I was thinking as Miles was talking about his experience and especially working at the university level, again, you, uh, the three of us right here and the people who are probably watching and the people who are listening to this, we're already invested in the space. We've, we, we are, com- most of us are comfortable, I would argue, in this space. Right. But even though we are, and even though in my school district, we have a state championship now at, for in Super Smash Brothers, hooray, go case, that we are looking to possibly have one of our general managers move on to a collegiate level, I'm hoping, fingers crossed, because there's another pipeline, right? But I still get those side eyes. I still get the glances. I still get the, oh, here comes Jim to talk about these esports things again. It, granted that the age of the gamer is closer now than it has been between a teacher you know, I grew up playing video games. A lot of the people in administrative positions play video games. But it's like this weird wall, like we were conditioned, that there is to be this wall that education and games can't possibly exist side by side. Like they, that, that we can't have this at, at, certain, at a certain level, play just goes out the window and it's not important anymore. This still, to me... You know, we need to be in, in, in looking at play in all of its forms in school, not just esports and not just video games, but, you know, where does it all fit? Even recently, I tried to get a get this a Dungeons and Dragons class. Let's go into one of our high schools. 
And the pushback was, well, what the heck does Dungeons and Dragons have to do with school? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. Planning, math, <laughs> you know, creative. I'd rather have a creative writing class that's a Dungeons and Dragons class oh rather than God. call it creative writing. Creative writing to a kid is like, are you kidding me? Dungeons yeah. and Dragons class, though, that has a completely different mindset. And the teacher who teaches that, as you were saying, Miles, the the, the math teacher who needs the ELA book, it's still it's it's there to support telling the creative writing teacher this is going to be a Dungeons and Dragons class, but you're going to get to teach creative writing. They're going, give me a minute to process that and let me sort through that and I can make it work. Right. Yeah. I think that's perfectly said. I think the idea is to play with the learning. Um, you know, the games are already gamified and they're filled with goodness, just like a book was already filled with greatness. You never saw an author who made, made a test for their own book at the end, you know, and like a game designer. Dave Burgess. Put, Oh, you're right. Okay, so there are a few, but like none that I would see in the canon that for for us, right? And like, it's so funny, like in games, James G says it, you know, like, it's embedded assessment, it's in there already, you know, we see the tests, we see the bosses, we see the scaffolding. And it's funny, because even if I work with my student teachers, you know, I've had five in a row last five years. Um, and we actually are in the middle of that chapter about, you know, the the looking at gaming and esports and, and how it affects the pre-service experience. And honestly, every single student teacher came to me going, wait, so we're going to do what? You know, like, oh, we're getting games in. Like, well, this wasn't in my transcript, you know? Like, I know, <laughs> like, I'm like, let's go, you know? And they're like, what do you mean? It started off with words and friends, clash of clans, clash royale, having this affinity space to text and game and to connect with my students and that evolved into you know the story we hear time and time again with every high school or club and for my teachers though they were actually a part of that evolution so they became comfortable with talking about you know maybe for the sherlock holmes unit you know there is a gaming device at one of those stations and it was more supplemental than more of the primary learning vehicle and slowly more and more people began to get in that vehicle and like i felt like my student teacher became more of a bus driver in this instance than they were just supplementally kind of getting it in and by the time you know you had a student teacher say hey could i get one of those esports jerseys i thought well now now we're talking like this is cool you're going to go to your cohort at the college you're going to be wearing this jersey you're going to start the conversation in that group like, wait, so your middle school has an esports team? Like, yeah, it's got my name on the back. Look at that. Like, I'm like, wow, this is important. This is really special. People are taking ownership of this. And then they're taking it to the college and going, look at this. Let's go. Well, and I think that's a very soft way to enter. And what I've, I'm very happy to see, and, and again, back to kind of Clint's thought of how do we redo this, right? How do we rethink this? Miles, yours, your, your approaches are also really important in that, you know, like just how I give an esports jersey to our superintendent or put the put the school district logo on the side because, you know, that the, the school board loves that. Or when kids are walking around town, they wear that and the community sees it. But even, you know, seeing what the University of Michigan is doing with their four million dollar grant, they're not doing what Ohio State did was which which Ohio State says we're going to have an esports business degree. No, what Michigan said is we got $4 million from a donor and we're going to look at this on an interdisciplinary level between kinesiology, IT and um, engineering, wow. which which, by the way, for me, I was like, OK, I, I, I've been talking to Purdue for the last two years, telling them they need to do this and Michigan oh, beats man. us to it. But I also looked at the, the university level and said, where is the education department in this? Like this, this is as much as engineering and IT needs to be a part of this. Schools of education should be dying to yeah. get in on this because the intrinsic motivation for kids is so high across the board. Why are we not, and Clint, why are we not studying this more? Not just at an inter, at a inter, at, at, excuse me, at a university level, but also at a, you know, in a practical sense. Yeah, well, we are. It's just it's there are no more secrets. They're just not evenly distributed. They're not even close to being evenly distributed. And there's so much work to do. I'm going to quibble a little bit. I, I typically start a conversation with more interest based learning as opposed to esports or what have you. And I know I, I'm preaching to the choir here, but but maybe esports isn't that thing 10, 20, 30 years down the road and so forth. But 
to me, it goes back to, I can walk into a school and very quickly, you could typically tell, is this a school for adults or is this a school for kids? Which I know I'm not supposed to say that as an educator, but that's a reality of the world. This is a a safe space for everybody. And and the schools that are are run for adults, well, they have their own interests and they're a math teacher or a science teacher because they're interested in that. The pedagogy may be extra and nice to have or whatever, but I'm really interested in X, the math. Well, why couldn't we do that for kids? If I'm interested in some of these esports titles and the lore and the community and the like, well, we should be running a statistics class that includes the data sets from my last game of league or my team's last game of league or the data set from all those teams over the past season. And we could all be analyzing it and learning statistical uh, components and standards and the like. And then we also can actually understand the variables, what they mean, how they're related intrinsically. And we can get to solutions that work for us. To me, it's about interest. And that's just one example that I would love for somebody to do. But to me, it's about that interest-based, student-motivated learning as opposed to esports. Now, I can't think of a better example of that right now in, in than esports. And that's why I'm doing this. And to circle back to the conversation before, not only is it does it have these additional affordances, it also has kind of a Vygotsky ZPD piece to this too, which is much harder with a standard Wait. curriculum or I'm teaching out so of the We gotta we gotta whatever. tell we gotta Absolutely. tell the audience. We gotta Sorry. tell you ZPD. Come on, you can't just go Z- zone of proximal zone of proximal development. Meaning, yeah. if I'm doing better and it gets it's getting easier, the game will twist and make it a little harder for me. Or if I continue to fail and fall off before I abandon or rage quit, it makes it easier and it does that. So that's what teachers should be doing in the classroom with static resources and so forth. Now we have these affordances from games, gamified esports and the like, which help do that work for us in general. See, for me, it was baseball cards. That's that's the thing that when I figured out baseball cards and I figured out how stats, that's how I taught myself ratios. That's how I taught myself statistics. That's how I taught myself percentages was based off of baseball cards, which then translated into uh, setting up teams in uh, hardball. I think it was hardball four or five where I could import in and actually go to baseball, you know, guides and look up stats and plug them into the computer and find out that, hey, this slugging percentage or this on base percentage thing is kind of important, even though a lot of people don't pay attention to it. I still think there should be a 1987 redo of the MVP vote because Jack Clark got robbed. Uh, Audrey Dawson's on base percentage was trash that year. But with all of that said, um, I think too, you know, the, the, what are we going to do? Because look, there are, (laughs) I I think we're still, we're still kind of dancing around the question. I think this is a part of a bigger thing that we need to consider when we're looking at how do we bring, as you said, Clint, it's not, may not be esports in 10 or 20 years, but just the idea of the importance of play in school right now this is the medium we are using to choose because this is where kids are choosing to play but if kids were choosing to play on basketball courts 197 percent of boys and 83 percent of girls our schools would look so different the equity of access would look so different we have a systematic problem with our schools when it comes to equity when we put a a technical solution in that that sometimes just increases technical inequities for some of our kids. But what I like is during this time, we've been looking at, you know, with COVID hit, okay, we got to get internet access into everybody's home. Um, even with some of our students here, we've had to work with our public library to bring in devices. You know, things that we take, some of us take for granted because we are gamers, we're finding out that no, no, for some of these kids, these experiences are few and far between because they can't get access. So maybe this opens up to the bigger question. Uh, through all this is how do we systemically change the education landscape? Oh, you know, that's, that's it. I I think uh, Clint, you were actually echoing that before is like, there's a deeper issue here. It's a, it's a paradigm shift. It's, it's approaching things by wondering, you know, how we do it, not if we need to, you know, you learn math by learning to use it, not if at some point you do, here's how you do it. You know, you learn by, Oh, I remember doing this. With some, you know, it wasn't you remember doing page 763 and doing the odd problem. It's like it's the same working on a car. The memories you have learning how to work on a car are probably the indelible ones from actually working on it, hurting your hand or those lessons, right, where that's how you know how to use that tool. And, you know, I took autos and I grew up as a, you know, my father's helpful son as a mechanic. And even in auto class, all four years I took it. 
I really don't remember a lot of that whole book and the combustion ratio out what well, you know I had to get a hundred on my safety test and yada 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 but I can remember the hard work and the oil and the smell of antifreeze mixing and 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 just just things that you would get oh you have experience we need to do that with games they're not some silver bullet um, but they're one more resource now. And the fact that we can compete with them and use them in any class, whether it's math or biology, that's the hidden gem of it. And a lot of people, they really need someone to brush off that dust and to really dip it in water and see the shine of it. And I think that's what this podcast does time and time out is like, all right, take a look at this. And you're like, whoa, see? And like the topic is now illuminated to everyone. And it just seems to be a little bit more transparent week in and week out about what we're trying to do. I think it's great. I, I think we, we can chip away at it, but I think in addition to that, agreed, but we need to give people permission. Again, mm -hmm. anecdotally, my experience, and I love the fact that the superintendent gets a jersey. I'm 100% going to steal that idea. Jim, thank you. So but when, when, when we see time and time again, and it's not just – well, we're going to put your, your your pay stub in email or put the schedule online. It's not a forced march to get teachers to adopt X. But when it's an engaged leader administrator in schools that are taking the time to learn and show, demonstrate learning, and then have a conversation, a dialogue, lead, a, facilitate that conversation around how this can be part of what we're doing, it it not only gives permission, but it's 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 a true leadership component to modeling what we're hoping then happens from superintendent to teacher or principal, principal to teacher, teacher to student and the like. So to me, to get really brass tacks, Jim, on what a next step is, we need superintendents and other school administrators, not just being open and not just giving permission, which is a good start, but actually diving in and being learners and embracing and understanding what this world is all about. That would be my wish if I were king for a day. And that's, and you know what? And I think that's, why a couple of reasons why I really got this podcast started. It wasn't just about, you know, helping myself because this helps me with my own thought process. Having converse this conversation today, I will take away, I will synthesize, I will grow from it. As I've told people, I, I don't have any sponsors. I've been approached to sponsor a few things, but to me, this isn't about sponsorship right now. Not that I'm saying I wouldn't love to make a whole bunch of money from doing this and retire and just do this full time, you know, give up my street cred from being in the school. But I hope, too, that this this furthers the conversation, because guess what? We are in a race it's just because, you know, schools are the way that they are. And we have these budgets that while they rise and fall. And yes, there are cuts. Um, the, it, the budget numbers are still very large. They're still very enticing to company for profit companies to come in. And we've seen it before. I've seen it many times where a superintendent goes to a conference and they come back and they say, Jim, I want you to take two hours of your time and go find out about this product and come back and tell me all about it. Or, hey, we're going to pilot this product, even though we have no support structures for it, we're going to pilot this in several classrooms, make it work. And it, there's there's there needs to be proactive conversations. We, as especially in the nonprofit spaces, those of us who are, um, you know, who are leaders, I guess you could say, whether it's at the state level, we need to beat the for-profit companies a lot of times to the punch and having these conversations before they do. Because when they get oh, yeah. to set, when they set the conversation, when they set the expectation, when they set the reality, that first idea usually sticks, unfortunately, in some cases. And then you have to unlearn, help them unlearn some of the things that they have learned sometimes. So I'm going to I'm going to jump in just for full disclosure. Last time I was on, I had my NASIF hat. I squarely have a for-profit company hat on today. I did realize I have the sweatshirt on. But I, I, to your point around, I, I'm not willing to accept what, what the, the market is pushing on us currently. Right. It's part of the reason why I had a career change about eight months ago, which see the two episodes ago or whenever it was. Um, <laughs> but it's why I'm working for the company I am now. I wanted to put in this structural piece or help be part of a team that's trying to address the structural components of how we support learners when it comes to esports. It's not about building the best new competitive platform. It's right. not about cutting the best deal with publisher X, Y, or Z. It's about building a foundational structure around 
a learning component, a play component, and a connecting with your community. And I always say those three, and I say connect last, but I've been thinking about it more, and I almost want to say connect first, because so much of my experience with students and esports has been around them finding community and finding a home within the school and after school and, and making those connect that connective tissue. And I think about connections as building a community with a streaming and broadcast and some of those. And those are the actions that we can help students take to do this or just get out of their way and let them do those things and provide some facilitation of that. But to me, the work I'm doing now and I'm so excited about is providing that structural layer so that school, the locus of control goes from third parties back to the school so they can be making curriculum decisions. They can be making competitive decisions. They can be talking about how they broadcast and build community, not just in the school, but around locally. So that to me answers that, or at least is a step in the right direction. I'm not being told how this should go down and may or may not include what I value. I'm being given tools to then do it on my own to scaffold and build and grow how we think it works best. Well, and and this is the thing, and you brought up community, and this is the thing I love about Miles's program at Albuquerque. Uh, Miles, you've been using Rocket League primarily as your game of choice. Don't you have a game coming up against Kuwait? Yeah, in a couple of days, I have uh, Kuwait and the Middle East lined up. Like, that's what I'm talking about. How, how, it couldn't couldn't be bringing the world closer together in some of the most unique ways, right? And, and I met Lisa Jennings, the coach of the Kuwait team, um, on LinkedIn, just from this community of people who follow this podcast, who comment on each other's stuff, like Tyler Rising, who's commenting on the stream as we speak. These people all have this community. It's like, and here we are like, okay, kids, we're playing Kuwait. And they're like, what is that? I'm like, it's a place, Um, you know, and we pull down the map and I'm like, hold on, we really do need to go. Okay, so where exactly is Kuwait, right? I'm like, I I, I actually, hold hold on. on. His classroom's an esports arena and he pulls down a map. Sorry, that, 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 (laughs) hey, old old school, Miles, all good. I like maps too, so yeah. There's nothing better than the drop down. You pull down that map and all With the multiple maps that wrap on top, yes. Yeah. yeah. And And it still has East Germany and West Germany. (laughs) (laughs) This is great. We're playing, you know. Russia's on there somewhere, yeah. In general. (laughs) How we could be talking about anything in esports would somehow relate, you know, and I, mm-hmm. I, I will bring that parallel back of the book. But, you know, you got to be able to use the book to learn anything. And I think at some point we have to learn how to leverage the use of games. And if we ignore using these tools to train teachers who are currently teaching, we like we avoid that. That will be bad. Like and if we avoid you know, the research that's leading to the change at the higher le- higher ed level of people going into the field, that's bad. So it's like, I do half of my work going into PD sessions with teachers who are already in the field, you know, and I make them play Fortnite and, they, and they're really like, at first they're like, oh my gosh, you know, and I'm like, it's all right, it's going to be fun today, you know, we're, we're going to, we're really going to enjoy this game, even if you haven't played before. And they're like, kind of, you see the side eyes and they're like, oh my God, I told you I should have stayed in my room. You know, 15, 20 minutes later, the room of 25 teachers is laughing and hitting each other in the back. And I go, time out. Look at everyone. Look how much fun you're having, you know? And I said, this, let's parallel this to when you introduce something to your class and they absolutely don't want to. Let's just call it a book, for example. And they have this huge barrier against it and you're going up against that wall. I said, it's your job as teachers to see how important this is to kids like, you are all scoffing at me and i saw i like point out to some teachers like <laughs> i heard you at the beginning i said look at how much fun you're having i said you all do that when you find kids entranced in a book and they're all reading in a room and you're like oh. and they're like mm-hmm. really really reading and you go oh time out time out does everybody see how great this book is even you you're reading in the corner and you love it huh and everyone's like yeah this is actually super good and those are those paralleled moments And I don't, you know, I have to bring that to teachers who have been in the field for a bit for them to see that it's not math blasters anymore. And then at the higher ed level, when I'm working with student teachers, we just play games as literature and we bring the VR headsets in and we plan lessons with it. But it's such a different mindset. Like, I feel very blessed to be able to go back and forth. But the whole point of having like, a bunch of research in my upcoming book is to promote some framework for people to really go, oh man, you know what? There is this sense of community and there is this 
there is a bunch of actual evidence now from people who have done this district adoption and who have really gone with this conversation we're having today. And I'm like so excited to drop this on the field because it's the first big stone to help us cross the river. I mean, other people are going to get just a little bit further now and drop theirs. And here we are. I mean, I feel like even just with this conversation, we've contributed a little bit across this river. So, well, so Jim, I'm sorry. I'm diving no, in again. Go, go, I, I, I want to play the naysayer in a little bit away, but really intentionally to try to continue to get that second stepping stone down. So we're fighting a structural situation in my home state of Connecticut. I can, I can do my my four-year undergraduate degree, become a certified teacher. I need to get my master's degree within five years. And according to the state of Connecticut, I'm all set. You know, the 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 CU credits and things kind of change here and there, or whatever. But there's no large structural, you know, explicit training that I need to go through. Forget I said training. Learning experiences that I can collaborate and construct meaning and so forth. There's also programs that, you know, an integrated bachelor and master's. So I could theoretically do it in five years without setting foot, maybe other than student teaching once. And for the next 35 years, I'm golden. I'm 100 percent. I go, how do we address this, the, the way that we do business, the business of teaching preparation right now? How do we fix it? Do we take the MBA model where I'm not going to let you into an MBA program until you go out and make mistakes and have experiences and the like? Is there something else? How does it become a meaningful experience so it's not just a forced march for teachers saying, oh, great, I just got to get recertified so I can get back to doing what I always do, shut my door and do my thing. How do we tackle that at scale? I struggle with that. I Again, this goes back to I, I love the model that I get to teach in because I, I'm completely almost asynchronous, 100%. We have a small space, a very small footprint where students come in as needed. And I... I I look at what you just presented, Clint, and I say, in my mind, I go, if my model was the model for everybody, I don't see a problem with your model necessarily of, of how they are presented. Because I feel that too often we design educational experiences to be defined by the location they take place rather than sure. the experiences that they provide. We have found through the pandemic that we can provide meaningful, it's as hard as it was for a lot of people, and I'm not saying everybody succeeded at this, but as hard as it was for some people to provide meaningful experiences for kids, there were some who really nailed it. Like they yeah. just, they, they actually paid attention at all those Google sessions they went to at state conferences and they actually, you know, right, right. took in research and they actually looked at, you know, some of these things and they did a really good job of, of doing that. And there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be new edu celebrities, unfortunately or fortunately, in the next couple of years who are going to talk about this. And I think, like, like I said, Clint, we need a systemic audit of, of everything that we do. I, there's a question I've been yeah. killing to ask you guys. It is about who, you know, it's not just us. You know, it's not going to be just the gamers who change all this. You know, what you're talking about, Clint, and, and, and in, in your question, there's going to, we have to find our allies. And I think the allies of the gaming space are going to be those who are really pushing for gender and racial equity in this space, because I really feel there's a lot of commonality beca between the two, because right. it is, it is making sure that everybody has access. Everybody right, can right, play. Right. It doesn't matter how you identify. It doesn't matter what race you are. It doesn't matter your socioeconomics. I think that that group, if I had to put us into, into groups, I know we all work in equity in different ways, but like my friend, Ken Shelton, I feel like Ken and I would be just, just, two people who come at it from both sides and really start to make some people feel like they really need to start looking at some systemic thing. Cause it's not curriculum, right? It's not cu curriculum itself. The idea of teaching math, the idea of teaching reading, science, none of that changes that, that right. we've, we, we've mastered that to death. We can, we could, we have all these materials we can use to teach with. It's how do we equally, I guess, intrinsically pull kids in and then equitably provide them access to learn and to be uh, successful students, and, and and that's and that requires a lot of redist. I don't I, I don't want to sound like a communist, but it, it requires a lot of redistribution of wealth. It requires a lot of redistribution of resources and thought. But if if it, it requires a whole unfortunate blowing up of the system that I don't think we have the stomach to do in a lot of places. So, so it sounds to me like Jim, you're saying, you know, let, 
if we get lemon, get lemonades, or let no good crisis go unleveraged, or I'm totally missing my meta, mixing my metaphors here. But are you saying there's an inflection point now because of the 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 pandemic and what what the ed tech space has been able to accomplish at different levels, you know, and and the the hyper training that had to happen because it was the only way to do it that we use that as a lever to pull, to really pull us all into this next generation of what education, systemic education could be. I think that's what you're saying, and I don't disagree with you. I think coupled with that, though, we have to- Yes, I'll just say yes. Thank you. We have to We have to actually pull back, and we, we all like to say lifelong learners. We all like to talk about how the old way was from an agrarian society, and that's why it's scheduled. Well, all that's true. We just haven't done a real good job of addressing and changing that. Yeah. So it's now that time- Lifelong do doers. That. Like that's yeah. what we need to see now. A- 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 amen. And I would say this idea that you can go to school and you can just in case all, you get all this learning just in case you need to use it sometime and go this circles back to what you said at the beginning miles learning in service of x a in something a goal that you set forth and want to accomplish is far better a far better learning experience than this just in case learning in this (laughs) canon that we think that we agree us maybe 40 and older agree is really important to go to me there should be a cycle of formal and informal learning not five to 18 and maybe 19 to 22 and then maybe a few after that right. that's what i want to blow up and if this is a lever to do that jim let's do it and if we can well, play some and, games too awesome well and here's here, here's why we have to do it now because guess what and this is happening everywhere remember january we have to get the kids back in school because of mental health right then what did the what did the message become after we got the kids back in school we have to catch up because of learning loss catch up to what who, who set what we are catching up to? And now we're pushing summer school and saying, well, exactly. we have what? What are you talking about? No, right. what we what we have to do, right? If, if it's mental health, we have to we have to take care of kids mental health. And that doesn't mean pushing them through another grinder of, as you were saying, Clint, five to 18, because guess what? As much as, as you if you want to call this an inflection point, it absolutely is, because in a year, if we do not inflect, we will be right back where we were. Sure. Pre pandemic. Everything in, will be back exactly as it was. In a system that works for a portion of our students because they follow the rules and they do school well, but we all know it's game. working not far, far too few of our students are willing to play that game. And I guess I would, the data shows that we're there. We're continuing to lose kids that are willing to play that game. So yes, sure. it's a, it's a, it's an opportunity, but who's at the wheel you know, there's a lot of money flying around that's coming down to schools and they're applying for it. Uh, and they're talking about how they will demonstrate the use of that and what they're planning on doing. But to your point, it's about um, and these are good things. But but they're these are these are covert ways in my mind to kind of just kind of get a makey uppy in there and we're all going to be great. We're just going to do this. We'll do this to the children and then we'll be right back where we are and we can all go home and say we did our job, but we're not fundamentally changing right. the opportunities we're providing and facilitating for student learners. We're just not doing that. Precisely. I am going to just jump in there and say, I do think that change is going to be slow because of all the stakeholders who are evolving into their forms to help out just as much as, the young person going through school who's maybe even pushing for that interdisciplinary esports curriculum probably is a graduate assistant who's now getting in the ears of the board and you know by the time they actually hire somebody they in that interview they're like you know anything about esports by chance like you know because they're like we need we need somebody coming in filling the spot of the tenured professor who was there for 35 years and i think that is part of the problem is who is disseminating the knowledge and how realistic is it versus the idealistic nature of every new book version that comes out that you give to that teaching class of whatever? It's what's happening in that class of eighth graders, like we talked about at the very beginning of this conversation. What's the present of the now? I don't care how old you are as a teacher, but how realistic is your interpretation of what's happening beyond the courses you're teaching. And remember, you could be going into math or science, and we're just talking from my perspective from the College of Ed. There are engineering departments, you name it, who need to be having, and probably are at some level, hopefully, this conversation of what part of the pie in that 18-week cycle does anything esports go into this? It could be chemistry, it could be whatever. And here we are, like, 
we're trying to just help out everyone who's watching this podcast to just get these conversations maybe going to their friends or a, a district leader watching going, you know, I could probably start that conversation, you know, or I could probably pick up on where we left off even here. I know a lot of people are doing some amazing things. So it's kind of like just wherever you're at, like, you got it, man. Like, lady, get for it. Like, go, go, go. Well, so, and I, I, wait, I got to say this because uh, it, to the point you just brought up, Miles, I know that there's one person in this chat from my school district who just chimed in, uh, Louis Melcheski, who is an assistant principal at uh, one of our schools here in Racine watching this. That to me, because I look at that school and I go, there's one, it's a middle school, K, K-8 school. And I go, there's a great place to to have a program. There's a person now who I can ha- maybe have a conversation with, refer this back to. But we also need to think about who are our, how are we developing our allies along the way? It isn't just the superintendent. Right. Um, I have worked really hard writing to my local legislators at the state level, not so much at the national level, but really where, where funding for education takes place at the state and really trying to develop that state network, those community stakeholders. And yeah, there are some people who just don't get it and they become very glassy eyed when you talk about all this. But uh, this is a topic that when your passion comes through and you're like, OK, there's just something cool for kids and something kids love. It's amazing how many politicians go, well, tell me more about that, because yeah. I got an election coming up about every two years. I have to you know, understand these things. And <laughs> and so I think, you know, also developing our 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 um, allies, as I said, not just in in large buckets, but also our personal allies in this, too, to help us have this conversation. As we said, when we're at this inflection point. Who can say, no, what James O'Hagan and what Racine Unified is doing, for example, is really good. What Miles is doing in Albuquerque, hey, that foundation you have down there, Miles, loves you. So, you know, there's there's your allies. When I start thinking about allies, oh, by the way, Mm -hmm. Lewis, make sure you hit Jim up for a jersey because I think all the administrative (laughs) staff should have them. Um, That's number one. But when I start thinking about allies, sometimes we we I, I immediately think of parents and publishers. I know that's kind of weird, but I've been very lucky to work with a group called COPE. Um, Mm -hmm. It's a a group of parents of esports professionals. Their sons and daughters are playing professionally. And shout out Shay and Chris, thank you for being in our community. They have done such a great job of of answering parent questions after parent questions. And I think it's kind of the same 20 or 30 each time. (laughs) So I want to help them go to scale because they've lived this. They've started being skeptical and they've seen the development of their kids over time and helped shepherd that. So they're a partner in this passion for their children, not an impediment, not a blocker. Uh, And I, and I, and I would love to, I would love to be able to help them shout that from the mountaintops. But I also say publisher, because I think the publishers Obviously, there's a financial goal for them often, but I think as a community, we should enlist them even more so. And Jim, you've been great at this, but enlist them as being a partner that becomes a win-win for all of us. They, their interest is, is young people, old people, all of us playing their games, enjoying it, having a good time. They make money. We get enjoyment out of it. I'm okay. I'm okay with that exchange of goods. But we also have a seat at the table as those customers, and we need to have, you know, equitable access to these games. And I'm not talking about financial necessarily, but I'm talking about schools should be able to access games. They should not be encumbered yeah. in any way. Sure, there sure, should sure. be ways to to peel back the layers of the games. You know, I know Overwatch may have hit the be on the backside of the bell curve. Please don't please don't say. I, publish that because I love Overwatch, but, but, you know, the workshop and being able to tinker and make maps and change variables and play with it, having features of games, which a lot of companies are doing now, we should be encouraging that more and more and having educators as part of the, the strategy group within these companies, I think is oh, critical. Yeah. You know, oh, Epic has okay. picked up, you know, it has Steve Isaacs that, on yeah. their team now. Thank you, Epic. What a great move. Having Steve Isaacs as yep. helping create part of the strategy of a move forward plan. Awesome. Keep doing those things. So we should enlist them as our partners, not the enemy. Absolutely. They're certainly not the enemy. They're making some great stuff. We, but we need to be, be, Stakeholders in this. Stakeholders yeah. in this, and we need to not hold them accountable. We want to be together in a, in a win-win, as opposed to some kind of win-loss or the haves and have-nots. And it speaks to your equity question, Jim. Mm-hmm. We should be work pushing on the right side of this so that it's an equitable experience for all of our students, regardless yes. of their current situation. To me, parents and publishers are such important allies for all of this. Absolutely, and and I, I don't need to. I, I was looking around for my soapbox. 
um, <laughs> because I was going to get up on it about Riot. But, you know, as much as I have railed against Riot and their change of rules, and I don't want to go into too many of the details, I will just say this. I welcome the opportunity to have a discussion with Riot in a, in a truly open and honest way about how many, I'll tell you this, we, we're playing Smite right now at the state level. I'm running, uh, or calling it the race for the cups. Uh, we're on our fourth cup right now. And as much as kids love playing Smite, they love League of Legends more and they just love the experience of playing. And I wish I could, you know, I know that there's dollars and cents and everything else that, that, that goes on. There's politics, unfortunately, but that's the thing that, that, Okay, I don't want to get too much into this. I just know I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, yeah, I'll just yeah, say I this. agree. I want I want to have a conversation with Riot, open and honest, and say, "Look, this is a great thing for kids. Do you realize how awesome this is for kids? And it hurts teachers to see kids who can't do something that they're passionate about. Understand that. I yeah, I would. That's that's well said. Definitely got to give everyone equal access to it. I and I envision too like. You know, what if we didn't allow certain kids to get books at the library that other kids were able to get, you know, and like, well, but you don't, you're not a such and such member. You're like, what? But I go to the same school. Like, why I can't get to check out this book. Like, this is ridiculous. Um, you That's know, a great way to say it. They're not even, you know, and it's not like most librarians are also going in. Would you like a switch for the weekend to check out, you know, and like, like well, yeah, actually, I would, you know, but that's not happening yeah. yet. Two, two would be nice. Yeah, two would be nice, right? Um, the pro that's rumored, I'd like that too. Yes. Oh um, yeah, don't even start. And you know, I definitely think we started in the days where you're riding in the back of the bus and you had the four cables hooking up Game Boys and you had a seven minute session to play anyways. By the time you got it working, and that was enough to get every go everyone going. And I think we have moved so far in my opinion, from the 90s when everything was translucent and cool and Tamagotchis and Apple you know, computers and, you know, 2001 hit, we had some crazy stuff with games and school shootings and we kind of just went, mm. and I think mm -hmm. we're finally right back where we were right there in that golden age of 2000, 2001 when it was like about to boom. I think we're now booming again. I, I really do. I think we we have just launched out of this area and we've launched off the precipice and now we are flying and we're like, anyone bring any freaking like wings? Like mm -hmm. I got Red Bull, but this ain't enough for this conversation. Yeah, you don't need any more Red Bull, my friend. I think you're good. We, maybe we have our first <laughs> sponsor, Jim. There we go. <laughs> first well, episode three. Well, this has been a very, uh, normally again, I've been trying to move the conversations back down to a half hour, but again, the richness, the depth, it, it this was well worth the time uh dr kennedy or dr harvey do you have anything you wish to promote i know uh dr kennedy you have the learn to esport jersey yes. hoodie on what is learn to esport for those of those who may not know exactly jim thank you so much for 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 asking i will keep this brief yeah, but uh uh about it was about a year and a half ago i was i was desperately i was acting as a director of education for an esports company and i was I was desperately desperate to get more into the structured educational side of the house as opposed to just business development. Um, so I went I went searching for some of these key tools that 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 I can have conversations with ed tech leaders, principals, teachers, and so forth. And I found this great little company called Learn to Esport out of uh, Uppsala, Sweden, just north of Stockholm. And I reached out to the uh, the CEO Rasmus Sandstrom. Um, and, and I said, what are you guys doing? What's the intention? What, what's, what's, what's happening? This looks interesting. A learning management system for esports. How does this work? Uh, and he kind of told me the story. He, uh, he's been uh, a professional athlete and kind of cut his teeth over the years in CS, large CS community in the Nordics and the like. Um, but schools had been reaching out to him as he had been running tournaments and building a tournament platform and saying, we need more structured way to scaffold for this, these, these experiences around esports that they're having. So ultimately, they built a learning management system and built curriculum for schools, specifically around CS and league, where they were they were they were spiraling through a curriculum around larger esports concepts, but also getting getting good at the particular game. So I thought well, that's really cool and really interesting. I want to know more about that. Ultimately, I ended up joining the company. I'm super happy I did. And we've expanded this from kind of a one-legged learning stool to a three-legged stool. So as I said before, learning, playing, connecting, where, the, where a, a school, an organization 
hell, a state can adopt the platform, they own it, and they can use it as a way to transfer that locus of control to them. So they're picking through, you know, curriculum opportunities that they develop or others have developed to help facilitate classes during school or after school. It's agnostic as far as competitive mm-hmm. platforms go. So you get to control what competition looks like from intramural to a state championship. And also we, we have a partnership with Twitch. So we're trying to build out their college curriculum at the middle and high school level so that students can build their community, grow, learn some of these skills tied to career and technology education and do that. So thank you, Jim, for that shameless plug. I'm like a kid in a candy store because I get to work on projects that I think benefit schools and kids as opposed to benefiting a third party that hopefully someday will benefit schools and kids. So I'm, I'm having a great time. So <laughs> yes, fired. if Shot people fired. are interested, you know, learn to esport.com. I'm happy to have a conversation. And, and I met them at uh, I met them at uh, the UCI conference a couple of years ago. Very oh, nice cool. gentlemen who run that company. Very very approachable. Um, and Miles, do you other than your big event that you have against uh, the Kuwaitis after you found them on the map? Uh, what else are you promoting? Other uh, anything? You know, anything? My, anything my to share? second book I got esports research and its integration into education. Um, 15 chapters, 35 authors, six countries, uh, should come out about, uh, around December. Um, man, that has been an incredible journey. And, you know, speaking with both of you this afternoon has really made me think about the three major themes that kind of emerged from all of the submissions and everything. And one of them was certainly community and soft skills. And you were talking about that. It might be some future discussion there, but I would like to label that section with those chapters, which is about 33% of my book, is something that maybe is that new thing. And then you were speaking to something I was thinking about. Um, as a good conversation always does, it leaves you with questions and some food for thought that I'm not even sure I have been chewing on enough yet. I'm definitely going to think about this stuff. Think about the book that's coming out. Think about how even this conversation um, has an influence on the way I edit that and look at it because. Every day I seem to learn something new, whether it's from this podcast or from just individually you all or the, the community, it seems to be moving quickly. Um, so, yeah. well, and when, when the book does come out, Miles, we'll have you back on and we can talk about yeah. the book. We'll bring all some right. authors on. We'll have some fun. I, I like that idea. I okay. love that idea. I will, I will watch that. All righty. <laughs> Well, doctor, I, I, I'm the I am the everything but dissertation completed. You know, I've done That's all cool. all but dissertation. No, it's not cool. I, ABC. Not, I, I need to finish it. I just haven't. Oh, you'll so, be okay. so we have Dr. Clint Kennedy, Dr. Miles Harvey. Thank you for being guests today on the Academy of Esports podcast. That will do it for this week on the Academy of Esports. I've been your host, James O'Hagan. Esports are organized competitive video games, allowing schools to redefine their athletic culture diversify opportunities for student participation, promote good physical and mental health, increase collegiate scholarship pathways, and play games. We can never forget the importance of play. The mission of the Academy of Esports is to support these ideals. The vision of the Academy of Esports is for all students to experience the fun and joy of playing competitive video games. You may follow me on Twitter at Jim O'Hagan. That's at J-I-M-O-H-A-G-A-N and through the Academy of Esports account at T-A-O Esports. It's a great way to get the latest blog posts, podcast episodes, and news coming out of esports and education. And remember, you can continue your engagement by going to www.taoesports.com. You can also connect through Facebook at www.facebook.com slash T-A-O esports. Thanks again for listening, and I look forward to our time again next week.